Thank you for joining me this evening for the first of the series of monthly programs from the Pueblo Archaeological and Historical Society. I'm Megan Wilbar, Museum Coordinator for the InfoZone Museum at the Rawlings Library. We're very fortunate to partner with PAWS to present their programs for the first Thursday of every month. So mark your calendars, it'll be every month starting um, today. And I'm pleased to present um, Spencer Little, who's the Vice President of PAWS and the Museum Coordinator for the Pueblo Heritage Museum. I'm gonna pass the screen on to him and then he'll introduce our guest speaker tonight, um, Dr. Jeff Broom. Um, and we're very happy to have you both here with us tonight and thank you for being here. Um, so just give me a second and I will bring them both back up. Hi all, I see myself on screen. <laughs> I'm assuming you can hear me. Thank you, Megan, for the uh, excellent introduction and thanks to uh, the Rawlings Library for hosting this program. And thanks to everybody also who's showing up right now or will be showing up uh, watching this after it's posted. Um, so we have our speaker, Jeff Broom, but before I introduce him, I'm just going to uh, rattle off some announcements. Um, Megan had mentioned this is part of a series of speakers. Um, our next speaker is going to be on October 1st uh, as Dr. Rebecca Wood, and she's giving a talk titled Storytelling, Revitalization, and Cultural Continuity with Place. Um, she's gonna be exploring the importance of storytelling in language revitalization. So that'll be Thursday, October 1st, also uh, on the Rawlings YouTube channel. And then in November, uh, we have Larry Lowendorf, um, who's gonna be speaking on rock art. So that should be really, really cool. Um, the Colorado Archaeological Society is going to be having their annual meeting on September 25th and 26th. It is, you guessed it, all virtual format. Um, but the benefit of that is it doesn't cost anything to go. So check out, they have a really nice speaker lineup. I think their um, keynote is the uh, Wyoming state archaeologist, Dr. Pelton. Um, so that'll be good too. And while I'm talking about CAS, um, our board is seeking a CAS representative. So that's just somebody who attends quarterly um, CAS meetings up at the state level, and they're held at the different chapters throughout the state. So you get to travel, meet with like-minded people, um, and we'll have elections for all these positions in November. So definitely reach out if you are into that. Um, I wanna also say thanks to Doug, who's the president, and generally we would be doing this thing um, for letting me give the talk. Uh, the benefit of that is you guys get to hear what's going on at the museum as well, because I think there's some overlap and in interest. Um, on September 18th, we're gonna have a film showing at six o'clock. It's a slight case of murder, a Damon Runyon film. Um, so that'll be fun. But then on September 25th, we're gonna get a free talk by uh, Phil Duke, he was the head archeologist for the Colorado Coalfield Project. And so on Friday the 25th, he'll be giving a talk at the museum and that's free, uh, we'll be at seven o'clock. And then on the 26th, Phil Duke is going to lead us in a tour of the Ludlow site, as well as Burwind and some of the Coke ovens down south. Um, so like I say, he was the head archeologist on these sites. So he'll be able to tell us a lot, should be really informative. And then we'll go do lunch in Trinidad and visit the museum there. So um, definitely stay posted with the museum, like us on Facebook and we'll keep you up with all of that. Um, okay, I'm about ready to introduce Jeff. I just want to say one thing. If people have questions during the talk, um, just because of this virtual format, please put your questions into, um, the question box, and then uh, we'll hold all the answers until the end. Jeff will get those answers, and um, but definitely don't wait to put your question. If you have something on your mind, jot it down. So, okay, um, thanks again, everybody, for being here, and thank you, Jeff, for being here. Sure. Um, our speaker, Jeff Broom, holds several degrees in philosophy with a PhD from the University of Colorado. Um, he has published three books on Western history and has won awards for several of his articles on Western history. Um, tonight, he's going to speak on his latest book, his fourth book titled Indian Raids and Massacres, Essays on the Central Plains Indian Wars. Um, Jeff will have later on in the talk details on how y'all can purchase those because they are literally hot off the presses. 
Um, so with that, Jeff, I think I will hand you over the floor. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Now, um, I've worked with Megan before, and I got my PowerPoint to bring up. And um, I, can you all uh, see that? Um, I'm going to um, start to slide. Oh, we're okay with the slideshow. Uh, start it. Let's see. Uh, from the beginning. And uh, as soon as I get that, we'll have this. All right. I presume you can hear me. Um, here's the title. Uh, and here's the day. And uh, I got a few of these uh, slides. So I want to go through them. And I'm going to tell you stories on each of the chapters. I have 13 chapters in my new book, which incidentally um, just came out. It's hot off the press. Uh, in fact, the uh, soft cover uh, author's copies, are, I'll get those in the mail tomorrow. Um, but a, a couple things to start this. I came across this quote by Albert Einstein recently and uh, thought I'd start that. Uh, the important thing is not to stop questioning. Curiosity has its own reason for existence. Boy, uh, I've been driven on curiosity on this. Uh, it's amazing. And then uh, from Deuteronomy 32.7, I got a little story on this, a uh, little uh, passage in, uh, in the Bible. Remember the days of old. Think of the generations long ago. Ask your father to recount it and your elders to tell you the tale. Well, um, I had uh, Remember the Days of Old in my first book, Dog Soldier Justice, which came out in 2003 with that left uh, hand uh, color side uh, there. I have an artist that does my artwork for me. His uh, father was my mentor at Boulder and uh, most brilliant man I ever knew. And uh, his son uh, is a, a Vietnam vet and great friend of mine. I talked to him on the phone just today. Um, and came out in 2003, but it came out with a little uh, historical society in Lincoln, Kansas, Lincoln County Historical Society, because this woman was captured. She's, uh, we're going to get to it in a chapter, um, in 1869. And uh, so uh, I got an email from the University of Nebraska uh, in about 2007 or eight, and I uh, wanted to know if I had the rights on that, and I did. So they uh, had come across that book, and they wanted to have it in their bison books. If you look up um, bison books at the University of Nebraska Press, they call them Western history classics. Um, it's stayed in print since then. You can get that for 20, uh, $22 uh, on Amazon. I sell copies too, but that's that right cover. Um, now, there's this pioneer monument in Lincoln, Kansas, that's there on the left of your screen. It was erected in 1909. It's got four sides to it. And what you look on the right side, you see some of the victims in the Indian raid. Uh, they got uh, uh, some ages wrong and stuff uh, that I uh, found out. But you see that? Remember the days of old? So I had that picture in my book, and I did a book signing tour in Kansas um, and uh, uh, sold several copies. And I was signing it, Remember the Days of Old. And this little lady that had worked with me um, in my research, and uh, Dolores Young, she comes up to me and she said, um, well, you, you know where that quotation comes from, don't you? I said, no. And she said, Deuteronomy 32.7. I looked it up and there it was. Um, Dolores was, uh, <clears throat> uh, I, she helped me with one small part in my research and I thanked her. And she had real bad arthritis late in life. And, and uh, after she died, her husband called me about a year later and said, uh, it's the last, uh, oh, about five, seven years of her life, she, that it was working with me on the history that gave her uh, the care for her sufferings. I, I that really appreciated that. He thanked me for um, for touching her life. Um, this is my third third book or second book, Custer into the West. It came out in two thousand nine. Um, I still have copies of that. I sell, although there's only about twenty left. Um, and it's a Custer's eighteen sixty seven Indian War campaign. Um, he uh, went uh, 700 miles from roughly the middle of Kansas near near Hayes, um, and he went up into Nebraska, and then he uh, came back down to where Binkelman, Nebraska is. That's right on the Colorado-Kansas-Nebraska border, and then he jaunted um, west and came up uh, about 10 miles uh, east of uh, Sterling and was there. I'm going to talk about that. I got a chapter on that, too, in my new book. 
And then uh, in 2003, this book came out. It's 500 pages, Cheyenne War, Indian Raids on the Roads to Denver, 1864-69. Um, and this is the new one that's just hot off the press. I, I haven't even seen it yet. I'm getting my paperbacks tomorrow. The hardcovers are out in about three weeks. It's also 500 pages. Um, same artist did the artwork uh, for me, Jim Nelson. Um, this, by the way, uh, is, if you write down Caxton Press, you can order a copy on their website. It's also on Amazon, um, but uh, they have it now. Uh, so you can, just the paperback. Um, now, I approached Caxton because I'd been publishing a lot of these little private uh, pamphlets for the Denver Westerners and some other private organizations. And they were never sold. They were just given to members. And um, a lot of them became collectible, $40 on Amazon. Uh, you, you can get one of these. Uh, $25 is a good price for it. It's called Indian uh, Massacres in Elbert County. New information on the 1864 Hungate and 68 Dediment. Dedeman murders. And so I approached Caxton. I said, look, I've done these essays going back to 2000. And I got enough of them to make a book and put them in chronological order from 1864 up to 1867. This isn't my first roundup. This came out in 2003. My first roundup with the Denver Westerners was 2000. So I put it and uh, Caxton liked it. I, I told him, like, I do extensive revisions, bring them up to date, all the modern uh, that we know about it and everything. Uh, and, and bring that out. So this is my, uh, this is chapter one. But if, if you notice, I down, I, I don't know if you can see my little arrow, but there's the 1864 Hungate and the 1868 Dedeman murders. So chapter uh, eight is the second part of this roundup. Uh, and I cover the 1868 Indian War. Now on the Hungate massacre, that happened um, June, June 11th, 1864, about 30 miles uh, um uh, southeast of uh, Denver, and or if you go into Elizabeth, Colorado, Running Creek passes there, and if you just follow Running Creek north, and the creek flows that way up to the Platte River, it's one of those rare ones, go 14 miles and you'll get to where this picture is taken, because that's uh, Running Creek right there where my arrow is going, and this is a county line road divider, and, um, and when you get on this side of it, that becomes Box Elder Creek today, it was Running Creek there, uh, it was generally called Box Elder Creek back in the 1860s. But um, there's some archaeology I did here. And um, it's kind of interesting. I, I got permission. Um, if we go back, and this is private property, it's now being sold for the third time. I got an email from the owners that they're selling it uh, just last week um, to let me know. Um, and there they've uh, first, second, third. So it's going into fourth ownership. Um, I got permission from the owners four times ago to detect this site because we had evidence that had been there. Um, it had been um, uh, archaeologically surveyed with the Denver Museum of Natural History. I think it was. Um, I got Bob Ackerley, who was a member of the Denver Westerners back in the 80s, and he had uh, located the site from an article in 1935. And uh, so they gave me permission, and I, uh, I found a load of stuff. And I didn't. I, I didn't have any reason to question the historical story behind this um, until I found the artifacts. And this is the most significant one. I found five weapons and I took them to uh, Dr. Doug Scott. He's the premier historical archeologist. He's retired now, but he was with the National Park Service. Uh, he did the, um, um, the Custer Battlefield Archeology span in the uh, 1980s. He's written several books on that. I took this to him and he took one look at it and he says, well, you know, this was in a fire. You can see the fire here and here. It's the, uh, what they call the breach of a rifle. I identified the rifle and he said it exploded here. This is where the barrel went. And this here down at the bottom is what ejected the shell casing you put in there. And, um, uh, and look at this. This is a Warner carbine right there. You see it? So I've turned this around here. And you can see this part here is that, and this part here is, is all this. It's all rusted up from the burned, actually. And, and where this is, uh, you can't see it, but if you turn this over, there is the uh, scar there where that was. That's not there anymore. This barrel blew up right here. And I asked Doug Scott, I said, well, the cabin burned down. The traditional story was 
Nathan Hungate, who was 29, was out working the ranch and he'd been out a few hours and he looked back and he saw smoke over the hill and he knew that was his cabin. And he had a ranch hand with him who told him don't go. And he went to the uh, to his family. He had a 25 year old wife, Ellen, and, and two uh, daughters, one three and one five months old. Um, and and uh, he was found dead about a mile from the cabin. And uh, the girls, the females, were found uh, dead and mutilated about 100 yards from the uh, cabin in the direction of those trees that I uh, picture from it. They were brought into Denver. The bodies displayed. That's the standard story, any, any history you read on it. But this shows that there was a firefight in the house. Nathan Hungate was home. And then I found some evidence that, in fact, he was home. The first newspaper article said his whip was found at the site. And other marks in, seem to indicate that Nathan was at the home when it was burned down. Now, the question is, why were they burned down? I got into records in the National Archives and discovered that uh, several people had given uh, sworn statements uh, to the government of uh, losses of, uh, of uh, theft of stock from all around that area. In fact, the bodies were first taken to the neighbor and they lost seven horses. And there was just a lady there by herself and she saw these uh, this Indian takes seven horses and uh, one was left and she chased him for two miles and joined up with others or 400 uh, horses and cattle taken in this area and not a single person was killed. Um, yeah, that lady chased him unarmed, trying to get her seven horses back. She gave her statement. Well, I'll tell you what happened. Um, when uh, uh, the day before, when all those thefts happened uh, on Ju June 10th, they came and stole at Nathan's place and he shot one and killed him. And there's the retaliation. Um, I published that in another article in a Wild West magazine. I got an email from a guy named Hungate. His father was a congressman who started the Watergate thing. Uh, on, they got Nixon out of the presidency. And David Hungate was uh, the guitarist for the Sonny and Cher show. And he was the founder of Toto, played the first four albums. We're friends now. Anyway, that's that first one. Uh, the stuff I got, it's, I, I got it all documented and I gave a bunch of it to the Aurora Museum uh, and I kept a bunch. Chapter two, this is a publication that just came out last year and it's the um, uh, real start of the Indian War. It started August 7th and 8th. Uh, that's when settlers were being killed for no, no reason. And uh, these are captives, these are four captives. The ones on the three on the left, the little girl being held and the 17 year old girl with her and the little boy over here who was uh, seven years old were captured on August 7th. Um, we don't know how many people were killed um, because um, there weren't any newspapers there then. The closest fort was 90 miles away. You got military reports coming later. You got survivors saying things. You got reminiscences coming uh, decades later. I got the, uh, I got the, uh, first-hand accounts in the National Archives in Washington, D.C., called Indian Depredation Claims. And that was when people were victimized by Indians. Uh, they had government investigations. They've never been published. Uh, they're not on microfilm. you got to go to the National Archives and visit them. And I copied five feet of these records just from the Indian Depredation Claims. And so I was able to find out a lot of the victims this way. I think I identified 38. Um, but there's some accounts that say as many as 100 were killed. Little uh, Eubanks here, uh, he was the nephew or the grandson of the father, grandfather, and all his uncles, six of them were killed. Two aunts were killed. Uh, this was her co his cousin right there, little I Isabel Eubanks. She died in Denver from the effects of her captivity from several uh, arrow wounds that the um, Indian women inflicted upon her for crying. And then this boy was taken the next day. So um, at Plum Creek, this is that picture. I want you to notice something in the picture. Um, see the chair that they're sitting on or whatever that is, you know, it's not level, is it? Because here's it right here. It needs to be up to there to be level with him. See where his shoulder is right there? Just make a straight line from that. Goes to his eyes. Some historians think this is nine-year-old Danny Marble. Some historians think because this guy looks older, he's got to be the nine-year-old Danny Marble. And that's the, is, uh, the Eubanks boy, but they're very wrong. Um, because I found some things in the National Archives that proves it. So this was the next roundup. And this is the uh, Plum Creek Massacre. Uh, 11 victims there, um, all killed. And uh, uh, one lady whose husband was killed and her brother and her first cousin. 
uh, was taken captive. She was rescued um, months later, got her firsthand account um, from the National Archives in her Indian depredation claim. See this picture? It doesn't have that little Danny Marble in it. That's because there's only two known photographs that exist. Uh, it was taken by a guy named Wakely, whose daughter married uh, Major Winecoop, who brought these captives in for the Camp Weld Conference before the Sand Creek Massacre. And this copy here is in the Nebraska State Historical Society. This copy with three, I intentionally kept the, uh, the wording down here. This is in my good friend Margaret Cole's book, Chief Left Hand. Um, Left Hand was mortally wounded at Sand Creek and died a, a few days later. He was one of the Arapaho uh, that was there. And um, when she did her research, that book came out in 1981, she got this copy. Now, she told me, I'm going to be quick on this. She told me that back in the early 80s, University of Oklahoma Press, her book's still in print. Um, she had to send all the original photographs there. I had to do that with Dog Soldier Justice. But now you just send images digitally. Um, it's much better. Oklahoma never returned these. And she said she had this copy here was from the granddaughter of Laura Roper right there. Her name is right here, courtesy of Ruth Dunn. She was in her 80s at the time that she loaned that photograph, which was never returned to Margaret. You couldn't give it back to her. And Margaret didn't realize that there's um, a person missing. Well, as I found out, there's the two pictures. When I got in the depredation claims, Danny Marble died in Denver. He never got home. He had typhoid fever from his, uh, uh, he got it when he, in his captivity. When he got to Camp Weld, he got sick. When Laura went home, she um, thought Danny was going to travel with her, but the doctors kept him back because he wasn't ready to travel. So she thought he was coming home. She wrote Danny's mother, who lost her husband, and said um, that, that Danny was sick, but he should be coming home soon. And th that's in the depredation file that I found. The original letters, I held them in my hand. I got copies of them. And then uh, Mrs. Marble writes her, Laura and said, Danny never came home. He died shortly after you came home. And Laura didn't know it. And she wrote back and she said, oh, well, I have a picture. And if I can't get another copy, I will cut out Danny's and mail it to you. And that's what's passed down in the family. She obviously mailed it to her. That's Danny Marble right there. Um, they had it misidentified at Nebraska because of the ages. This boy looks seven. And this boy looks nine, which incidentally, I found the great grandson of this boy. Uh, he's a, a former officer with the uh, Oregon California Trails Association. And he uh, told me that uh, when he went to an OCTA convention in uh, 1995, it was the first time he ever saw that picture. And he knew that his great grandfather had been captured, but he had just seen this picture for the first time. And before he was told who was who, he pointed to this one on the left and he said, that's a dead ringer for my uncle who would, uh, was the um, uh, grandson of Ambrose Asher. He died at 37. Four months before he died, he gave a sworn statement of his captivity. It's very powerful. I have it in the book. Um, and so there they are. He was cut out. Um, there's where he'd sit if that picture were together. Um, now, these are the Cheyenne chiefs that um, and a couple of Arapaho that uh, Winecoop, who's here with the long hat, and uh, Tim... Timothy Soule, who was killed in no association with the Sand Creek. These two really went against uh, Colonel Shivington and the Sand Creek Massacre and started the investigation. Um, but when you read the historians that try to say that he was assassinated because of his testimony, it's completely wrong. Just get the new biography on uh, Silas Sewell. Just Google Amazon Silas Sewell and books and read it. it got a whole chapter of what happened to this guy. Uh, he had nothing to do. Uh, with a Sand Creek Massacre, didn't even know Shivington. But this is Winecoop, and I want you to look right here. This is Bull Bear with the big earrings. In the depredation claims of that um, uh, statement, uh, of that uh, Plum Creek Massacre of uh, Mrs. Morton, she said she was captured by Bull Bear and made to be, uh, uh, to serve him, you know, was, uh, raped by many others. So one of the chiefs that Black Kettle right here brought in was one of the chiefs that it was at war, but he led Winecoop to believe that none of these did anything and they traded for these Indians. 
So I, I have that stuff in there. Um, I have a lot more. Uh, uh, I, I try to correct things. Here's, here's one right here. This is white antelope, okay? This is white antelope here. He's killed at Sand Creek. When you read histories of it, almost everybody says he was 77 years old. That means he's 77 in 1864 when he's sitting down here. That means he would be uh, 60. Uh, this picture was taken in 1852. So he'd be 65 right there. Is that a 65-year-old Indian? <laughs> when when Black Kettle's killed at the Washita, uh, four years later, he's 66. So they're roughly the same age. They say 77. And here's an 1852 picture of him. And 12 years later, here he is here. He's not 77. Um, here's another picture of this take. I mentioned white antelope because my great, great uncle right there, that's uh, uh, Hugh Melrose. He joined in uh, Colorado City, left Pueblo, and joined the 3rd Colorado Cavalry. He was at Sand Creek. Um, the military side of the fight at Sand Creek was at uh, um, white antelope. And uh, uh, this is bull bear right here. Um, I'm trying to remember where this is black kettle right here. And this is uh, that's white antelope right there. Um, that his my great great uncle's uh, Lieutenant Templeton in his memoirs in the Pioneer Museum in Colorado Springs, his type memoirs, he said Hugh Melrose was in the heaviest of fighting and he was the one that killed white antelope. I think my great great uncle might have killed him. Um, he married my, um, he's not my blood. Uh, he married my great, great aunt by blood. My great, great grandfather came out here in Pueblo in 1859 freighting and settled in uh, Boone in 1863. And when the Indian war started in 1864, he went out there by the, uh, uh, by the good night uh, cabin, eight miles west of uh, on the Arkansas river of Pueblo. And that's where my great grandfather was born. Anyway, he brought his sister out in 1863. She died in Pueblo in 1872. And she married Hugh Melrose. Chapter four, this roundup came out in 2014. It won two uh, national awards, one international. Um, collateral damage, Sand Creek and the Fletcher Indian captivity story. Uh, this is a very interesting story I found in, again, in the National Archives in DC, it was unknown. This is Amanda Mary Fletcher. She went by her middle name. She was 17 when she was captured. She turned 18 in the captivity. Uh, her mother was killed about 50 miles west of Cheyenne, uh, Wyoming today on the Laramie River. Um, her mother was killed and her two-year-old daughter or sister that she was holding in her arms was taken and they were separated. And Mary Fletcher was uh, rescued in uh, 1866 in February. Um, she was captured in uh, uh, probably August 1st, 1865. Uh, so uh, she was in captivity till February of 66. Uh, if you read Custer's My Life on the Plains, her and her father, who survived, and he didn't know that uh, she was alive or dead, and he'd made his depredation claim, and they're trying to recover the little girl. And uh, Custer uh, was written to help. And, and one of his lieutenants and one of his scouts, he has it in his My Life on the Plains, had seen the little girl. And uh, what Chief had her and said, you could trade for her. They never got her. Oh, but wait. Uh, 35 years later, in 1900, um, at the Wind River Reservation, about 100 miles north of Casper. And the Central Plains, by the way, is the North Platte River from Casper going into Nebraska and into Omaha and the Arkansas River from Salida going then in Southern Colorado. That's the Central Plains, the area between those. So Wyoming and Colorado and Nebraska and Kansas. So anyway, they come to get their annuities. They bring down a bunch of wagons and they unload the train. They got a bunch of the men that are loading it up and they brought down about two dozen uh, Cheyenne women that were selling trinkets in Casper. Trinkets is what the paper said. Um, that, you know, their beadwork and stuff. And they're looking and there's this one Indian that's blonde and blue eyes. She couldn't speak a lick of English. So they asked one of the older guys, uh, one of the reporters, who's that one? Said, oh, we got her 35 years ago. And it got on the national news in Davenport, Iowa, her older sister read it. Wrote the Indian agent at the Wind River Reservation said, I believe that's my sister. 
In uh, 1902, two years later, they met up there on the Wind River Reservation. And uh, that was her sister. Her name was, um, uh, let's see, her name was Kels II Brokenhorn, this is her husband. And she learned that her name was uh, Elizabeth by Lizzie. And Mary tried to get her to come back to the White Society. And it's all through an interpreter. And the interpreter told her, no, uh, through the interpreter, I do not remember my white family. I will not come home. You are not my sister. I'm an Indian. And um, really broke the heart of uh, her sister. Coincidentally, they both died 20 days apart in the same month in 1928. This picture here goes back to Hollywood. When they were out, as were about 75 of those Wind River Arapaho, went out to California uh, to film a movie called The Covered Wagon, which you can get on, uh, uh, on DVD today. And they're in it. Uh, and I've watched the movie twice and I can't see him. But they were out there for about three months in the filming of that and all the other Indians and all that. And that's when this picture was taken. I've uncovered all that story. You won't find it anywhere else. It's very, very fascinating. Uh, in fact, a descendant of uh, the, one of the little boys that survived uh, has ordered already uh, two, two copies of the book from me. Um, this is, you know, I took pictures of these roundups, so that's why it's not quite clear. Chapters five and six are with Custer and the Kidder Massacre. And uh, so um, I expanded these. And with Custer, I got in the National Archives and I found his itinerary officers. Um, itinerary reports never been published. He, he drew 28 maps. You can see this is red uh, is where they, they march. These are two campsites on one map. Um, and this 42-day uh, campaign, uh, they went, uh, uh, what was it? Uh, over 600 miles. See the Platte River there? That's the camp at Riverside Station. He wrote in his journal on that day that um, the soldiers camped one mile west of Riverside Station, and he has the camp on that day. This is a famous camp because uh, almost 11% of Custer's command deserted in the two nights they were there. And um, um, Custer ended up being court-martialed after this because the day that they left after this, they went into a camp 10 miles down for four hours and 10 more men deserted, five on horseback and three walking. And the three walking, they had already gone over a, a, almost two miles when they were spotted. And they sent officers after them and three of them were shot and one of them died. That was part of Custer's charges that he got court-martialed for at the end of the campaign, uh, shooting deserters without a trial. Um, so uh, this is famous in Custer's... Uh, a story because he got suspended for service for a year. That's in Colorado, man. <laughs> so I did my research. Where was Riverside Station? Because the camp was one mile west and I found where it was and I went out and I met the landowners. Uh, they've had it since 1950 and bought it from the homesteaders uh, of 1890 children, uh, two of them who never married, a boy and a girl. And uh, so it's it only had two owners and still that way. And uh, the the dad was dead, but the two boys, they were uh, two years and one year older than me. We became good friends. I'm still good friends with them. They had about three miles of the Platte River. And uh, they said, yeah, you know, I remember my dad saying that we have a state stop, but I don't know where it is. Well, could I find it? And I, sure enough, I found it. Here we go. Uh, this is just uh, dropped ammunition and stuff from the military. This is from uh, Civil War rifles. Um, now, uh, these are just some shell cases. I got... Five things, sets of these of, of that. So I'm talking to the uh, the one brother, and I said, "Look, I got this map that says that Custer, in a, with a journal that says that Custer camped a mile west of here. Even in the 2004 drought, you could still see the outlines of two buildings when there was nothing there from the adobe walls, right where I was finding all that stuff. And um, so, so they, uh, he said, "Yeah, yeah, there is. We got some hills, right, about a mile west." And I said, is that your property? He said, yeah, that's right where the property ends. He took me up there. I, I, I followed him and I got out of my car and um, got my detector out of the trunk and just, you know, turned it on and, and ran it by my foot. And there's a beep. There's an eagle button. Uh, talk about the stuff I found. By the way, by Riverside Station, going further east, about uh, 200 yards, I found this coin. Um near some teepee rings. And back then they would, uh, this is a front and the back of it. You just can't read anything. It's hard to show, but you can see a seven and a one and a six. 
Um, I gave it to a coin expert, and it's a Connecticut colonial penny. They only made them for three years. He said, in this shape, it's it's worth several hundred dollars. Um, so I wondered how to get there. That's a, that's a mystery of history, you know. You find something like that and how to get there. Fur traders coming out in the 1820s, 1830s, trading with the Indians, bringing a coin. They put it uh, and they carry it as a bracelet on their uh, ankles and it gets lost there. It's passed down a couple of times. And that's the only way I can explain how I could find that there. So he said, yeah, look at the stuff I found. I found 72 Spencer uh, that was for their rifles, Spencer cartridges, unfired. I found 92 eagle buttons. Several of them are burned. Uh, Custer burned their uniforms. Um, and, uh, um, and see the JG? Uh, that's the bottom of one of those Spencers. Jacob Goldmark was manufacturing for the military in 1866. Uh, not after that. It fits the time perfect. And then I found this. I wonder, what the heck is it? And uh, look at the wear when you turn it over. It's brass and it's feathers. And then I, I was there with a, oh, I let a friend go there and uh, I gave him permission to the family and all that. And he came down from Nebraska and he found this one on the left, down on the trail off of the hill, 200 yards away from where I found that one piece. See how you put them together? I said, oh, I got to have that because I already found the earlier piece. So I traded him some stuff for it. I had no idea what it was until I did some research. These were given to command positions in the Civil War. These are some examples of them. Um, Custer got a division uh, right before Gettysburg, a, a brigade, excuse me, and then he got a division in 1864. He could have got that, uh, that at either one of those. There were 12 officers with him there. The highest rank of any of them in the Civil War was colonel. None of them had a command position, would have had these. I think that's Custer's, especially when you look at the wear on it. Look at the wear. And it's a it's a stress fracture. And I could see him looking up there and seeing all those uniforms that the men deserted and saying, burn it. And then he goes back. I got the telegram in the National Archives where he said the men deserted. And he, he put that uh, rowel in the flank of his horse and that broke it. And that's why that one piece fell up on top and the other piece stayed on him. And... There it is. And in fact, there's the identical one sold at the Heritage Auction. <laughs> see it? It's a rowel just exactly. I took the rowel out because it got was loose. So you see the pictures. I have the rowel. That's the identical one. Command officer positions in the Civil War. How could that be there? There were no other artifacts up there because it was off the trail. There's no beer cans. There's no trash. Uh, we found spurs there. Uh, all kinds of stuff. Now, when Custer left there, and he got on the telegraph. He learned that Lieutenant Kidder had delivered him dispatches telling him where to go, and he never got them. So he backtracked, and on July 12th, he found the remains. This was on the front page of the Harper's Weekly in August of 1867. There it is there. I got an original, the whole entire 16-page uh, magazine um, on eBay for $18. I have it hanging up on my wall. Um, so this is the Kidder massacre. Where did it happen? I found it. There's an Indian pictograph in the Colorado Historical Society, Cheyenne Ledger book captured at Summit Springs in 1869 that shows the men, including the Indian scout, which Custer described as having, you see my arrow there, a, um, uh, what was that, was a scalp lock. And he had been scalped, but the Indians left the scalp there, of which the scout said the Indians never keep scouts of their own kind. And that was true. He was Lakota. And part of the Indians were, shot, were Lakota. Uh, with Pawnee killer, Oglala, and they killed Red Bead. There he is there, and there's all the Kidder men. Uh, there's something to observe there uh, in my interpretation of this when I found the site and the relics um, was that um, only one or two men were captured there where this was taken alive and tortured. Uh, Lieutenant Jackson said in his itinerary journal that day, one of the men had been uh, uh, brought to death by the uh, tortures of fire. Um, and here they are doing a ceremony of them. They dragged them down with the relics that I found. Uh, they stripped them up uh, around where it was. This is Lieutenant Kidder. He was only 24 when he died. And this is the map that shows them coming down. And they cross Beaver Creek. And there's a nice little gap there because they had to jaunt to the west to get a flat crossing. I found it. Found the trail marks up there in the spring where it jaunted to the left right here. And um, 
Uh, and that's the only place you can cross there. And there's the X. And he writes here, here found uh, Lieutenant Kidder and 10 men, um, second cavalry um, and, and one uh, Indi Indian that was red bead. Anyway, I've, I have that in my, uh, uh, in my book, uh, you know, when I hold it in my hand, uh, you can read it. It's a little hard to read on this, but he's got an X there. And Lieutenant Kidder wrote that uh, they were, the men were buried a half a mile west of the crossing or east of the crossing. And that's what, and Custer said they were buried near where they were found. And Lieutenant Jackson gave specific uh, at the farthest jaunt north of Beaver Creek and about 35 yards up from that where the hill was. And when I found the ravine, I found things in the ravine um, and I found, um, um, uh, and then, then I went over to where they would have been buried on that hillside. These are some interesting things. There's a JG on this I found, again, dating it. But look at this arrowhead I found right where the burial was. You see, the men were pummeled with 20 to 50 arrows after they were stripped naked and the ceremony was done over them. And they were buried in this hillside in a trench. And then eight months later, Lieutenant Kidder's father, um, who was a Supreme Court justice up in the Dakotas and donated the land where uh, uh, the South Dakota's uh, University of South Dakota is. Um, and they removed them uh, down to Fort Wallace. When Fort Wallace closed, the remains are at Fort Leavenworth now. When they removed them in the cold of the winter, one of these arrows was laying there. It's bent. I had Doug Scott analyze it. The first thing he looked at it, he said, this is amazing, Jeff. Um, because the bend in it, he said, it hits something soft because there's no bend, in the, in the, no dent, and then hits something hard and couldn't go through it, the bone. Uh, but somehow it fell off. Uh, maybe it was an ankle bone or something that was left there. Um, and I got the report to the retrieval of the bodies and said that, um, well, Lieutenant Beecher, who died at Beecher Island uh, in September of 1868, and this is a March of 1868, uh, he writes his father. I got that letter. And uh, he said it was so sad to have uh, Lieutenant Kidder's father there because the wolves had opened the graves and the bones were scattered for yards. Um, but uh, so anyway, I found that where the gravesite was. And in the book, it's not in color because that's much more expensive. But there were three people who have detected this site. The orange there was a the guy that detected it for um 18 years and invited me to join him and he'd never gone east. And that's where I, all that blues, all that stuff I found. And then the former sheriff of Sherman County, where this is, lives in Goodland. He's a good friend of mine. And I took him there and got him his permission. And then he's detected it and detected it and detected it and detected it in all that red. And uh, so here's uh, Beaver Creek, um, right coming here. And the crossing would be right down here. And then you go a half a mile and you get right there. And that's where the little ravine was. I didn't put a picture in it. I have it in my book. And then the hillside right right here. And right where um, the creek comes up here, right, right there. That's the furthest north. So anyway, I got that. And then I published in a British journal. Uh, uh, that's chapter seven of my book. It's, uh, extremely expanded. And then in uh, that part two of um, the roundup, I'm going to go fast on the Dedeman stuff. Um, and then um, that Susanna Alderdice that I talked about uh, at Summit Springs uh, in that Remember the Days of Old when she was captured. Here's Shrey Vogel's painting. This, uh, this roundup, by the way, is um, I just got the, uh, I just proofed it uh, yesterday. And it's not even published yet. They're timing it for my talk on September 12th. I was supposed to give it in March, but the pandemic stopped it. So I'm doing a Zoom thing with the Denver Westerners there. And uh, that's the first time they've ever done a color. That costs $400 if you want to use that painting from the Cody Center. But the Cody Center gave me a grant 20 years ago to study up there. And I got all the stuff. And that pays for everything I published with that. So uh, my artist did my stuff. This is Susanna Captured. Her children were uh, all killed, except one little four-year-old boy was found alive the next day multiple arrow wounds in his back. And she was killed at a rescue at Summer Springs, and that's a burial. And this was the actual arrow that was in her little four-and-a-half-year-old boy that was found unconscious with five arrows in his back, shot twice and speared through the left hand next to his dead brothers, all stripped naked. Uh, I have a boy that's 12 now, 
but I got the exact day that Willis was when he was captured, when he was wounded, when my boy was at. And he happened to be playing in a neighbor's yard. This is a little jacket my grandmother made for me in the 1950s here in Pueblo because I watched Ren 1010 and I loved it. And he put that on, this hat I bought him when we went up to Custer Battle. I bought an Indian made arrow. So I said, hey, Kyle, I want to take a picture of you. What, huh? Look, he did this himself. And uh, so he was a little scared when I put that arrow on his back. I wanted to see what a child looks like that had five of those arrows in his back. One was embedded in his sternum and they couldn't pull it out. And they finally pulled it out two days later with a bullet mold. And that's what's in the Lincoln County Historical Museum, that arrow I showed you. This is Willis. I found all his descendants. He was lost to history. I got uh, One descendant had his wedding photograph, and this was the day he got married. And these are his three children here, um, right there. This is his wife. Uh, he died in 1920. She died in 1948. These ladies died in the uh, 70s, and he died in 1954 in Denver. And when I got the names and found them, uh, we knew that Willis, this is him there, isn't he a handsome guy? He named his uh, boy James Alfred. I wonder, why did he do that? And his name was Daly be, uh, because the first husband was, uh, the first two children were by that first husband who died in the Civil War. And I found his his uh, grave in uh, Fort Leavenworth. See how they misspelled it, E-Y? And I got in the National Archives, there were over 600 dailies spelled both ways um, that had pensions. And you can only see about 20 a day. So you can see how long it would take me. So how am I going to find it? Because the little boy would have gotten a pension because the dad had died, see? And um, sure enough, he did. He was raised by his uh, mother's parents. And uh, he named his son after his father right there. I found it. And so when I saw that it was wrong, I got it corrected. And if you go to Fort Leavenworth, you see this one. They destroy those. I tried to get it donated to the museum in Lincoln, but they won't do it because those things can end up on eBay. Um, so there he is. And there was a picture of his father. And on the right side of it, uh, none of, there were no names. Uh, 88 year old granddaughter looked with a, didn't, didn't know who this guy was. I had it analyzed by a civil war expert. He said it was a Kansas infantry. He was in the 17th Kansas volunteer infantry in 1864, hundred days, got sick with typhoid fever in his 98th day and died about four weeks after Willis was born and never knew his father. Um, this is Summit Springs. I'm gonna fit, I'm almost done here. Um, I had a guy that metal detected there and he uh, died and uh, got the, uh, his, the, his uh, son to donate the relics, about 6,000 to uh, the Overland Trail Museum. And they, uh, there's, I, I don't know if they're on display yet because the, uh, Larry died just a couple of years ago and they donated them last summer, my recommendation. This fight at Summer Springs was no contest. Accounts that either 52 or 73 Indians were killed. There were 17 women and children captured. The Dog Soldiers Society was broken. They had two captives in there. They killed Susanna uh, at the beginning of the fight, and they critically wounded the other lady. More about her in a little bit. Only one soldier had a glancing arrow wound to his ear. 14 horses were killed, 12 of them by exhaustion chasing Indians and one by lightning at the end of the uh, fight, and one in the fight by uh, Sergeant McGrath's horse. 84 lodges and 10 tons of property were burned the next day, making 160 fires. And they filled, before they burned that, six empty wagons with uh, stolen property to return back to people. This is Maria Weichel, who was captured, and she disappeared to history, and we found her descendants. And um, this lady who's in her 70s, she had no idea that this was her great-great-grandmother and had no idea. And and uh, so a grandson was still alive in his 90s and she hadn't seen him for 40 years. She went out to California to see him and said, did you know that your grandmother was captured? He said, oh yeah, I knew that story. Well, why didn't I know it? Well, I don't know. I got a picture of her, you want it? <laughs> so there, that's how I got the picture. And my artist drew her capture because her husband was killed and she was three months pregnant with her only child. And that is the descendants that we found. And she was shot in the back and then uh, grabbed a soldier uh, when, uh, and couldn't speak any English. Um, here's that finger necklace, Spencer, I was telling you about in uh, the Bureau of Ethnology. They found a finger necklace in the village too. And uh, this is a Cheyenne finger necklace that was taken in another Cheyenne fight. Um, they're very, very rare. I, I couldn't even find one for my first book. Um, but um, anyway, then, 
Uh, this is another one. Uh, the soldier that was there at Summit Springs was killed by Wild Bill Hickok in 1870. And I traced him down. He had the Medal of Honor. Uh, it's a fascinating story. In fact, I got an email today. I'm giving a talk in Oakley on this uh, in October. Uh, and then uh, this journal of the Wild West History Association, I did a little thing on James Alexander Moore, the depredation claims. He's a Pony Express rider. It has a record for the longest ride, uh, 280 miles from Midway. Here's Kyle's uh, fight. Uh, it's all, uh, I, I found out the truth on it. You read the books on it. It's all fiction. He was killed in Tommy Drum's saloon. This is Tommy Drum right there uh, in that saloon by Wild Bill Hickok. This is not the two soldiers that were killed by Hickok. Hickok only killed one soldier. These are so, you'll see this sometimes. They say, oh, these are the soldiers Hickok killed. Those 1873 soldiers in a different saloon in Hayes. But I found the pictures. I want you to notice something on them. It's taken almost from the same place. You see there's four columns here on the left. And this they moved it closer for this picture. Because there's the four, there's the four columns, but you're right up on it. So they moved it up closer. In the first picture, here's a little boy. In the section, second picture, here's two ladies. And that might be that little boy uh, with his back turned. I'm not sure. Um, this is Kyle's. I, I I investigated, found all of his desertions and everything, his Medal of Honor. And um and, and by the way, uh, Captain Keo, they made a final statement. I found this in the National Archives. And whenever a soldier dies in the line of duty, the company commander has to say how they died. And so the first final statement, he wrote, died of a pistol shot July 17th. And so when it got to headquarters in uh, Missouri or at Fort Leavenworth, they sent it back and said, did he die in the line of duty? And, and Captain Keo got a little angry there because he said, uh, on this one, Fort Hayes, Kansas, um, in the post hospital, by reason of pistol wound, pistol ball uh, wound, received July 17th, 87, in a drunken row in Hayes City, Kansas, and not in the line of duty. Private Kyle, alias Kelly, who had deserted from the 7th Cavalry, he confirms it right there, was originally a deserter of Troop M of the regiment. And on re-enlisting, was assigned to Troop I, that was Captain Keogh's company, but attached and doing duty with Troop M at the time uh, he was killed. So uh, a, a, a sergeant that was knew him well and deserted with him in 1867 and got exonerated, took him to Custer and showed him the Medal of Honor, and Custer was transferring him back when he was killed. And when I got his enlistment papers, just check the J on each one. They're identical. Um, his Medal of Honor was given in the name of K-Y-L-E. Uh, they misspelled it. And um, so uh, he enlisted uh, three times as John Kyle in the infantry, uh, 5th Cavalry and 7th Cavalry. Uh, once in the 7th Cavalry as John Kelly because he deserted as John Kyle. And then with his Medal of Honor papers, he enlisted under the John Kyle and deserted the next day. An officer must have seen him who recognized him for his uh, court martial and three year prison sentence he escaped from in this middle one. Um, and then he uh, came, look at that, uh, uh, one week later, enlisted in Chicago's John Kyle, and he died uh, a month later. Um, well, they had his, uh, at Fort uh, Leavenworth, they had his Medal of Honor thing wrong. So they destroyed that, and I gave them all the information, so they fixed that. And this is the Pony Express ride. That building's still there, Midway. And he drove, rode 140 miles to Julesburg, and then took a short break and rode 140 miles back. Uh, that's Jim Moore. His ranch owner, he owned an uh, American ranch, sold it when the Indian War stuff happened. And then he um, uh, owned a Washington Ranch with his brother, Charles Moore, and when they um, when he came into business with him, they called it Moore Ranch. And this is Cheyenne where he ended up in. That that this is house. He had a lot of. Uh, it's a very interesting story. He dies in uh, 1873. J.M. I don't know if you can see it is uh, named after him. Uh, that because this uh, ranch was a J.M. Ranch for J. Moore. Uh, now chapter 13 might interest you in archaeology because I got a state grant to my college right before I retired, it's the last thing I did. For two years, uh, we spent that grant money and we used ground penetrating radar all over the area where uh, Susanna should have been buried and brought in Doug Scott um, and did uh, uh, archeological coring and all that and 
did, didn't find her. And then we did a magnetometer with the uh, state archaeologist, uh, uh, Danny Walker, uh, at um, Wyoming. He's retiring. So that new one is a state archaeologist that's given the talk that Spencer talked about. This is uh, Summit Springs. These are the springs taken in the 30s. And this White Butte Creek flows to the south and then goes west, goes north up the Platte River. Um, this is up by Sterling. And they built a dam in 1960. And this is a picture taken maybe in the 80s or 70s. Shows the dam. That's right in the center of the village. And, uh, and then we superimposed the old one on it. So you can see where White Butte Creek went down through there. Um, and uh, so Susanna was buried right around in here. Now, the guy that made the dam and the bulldozer, uh, he died in 1976, but um, he told the property owners that when he was digging up that dam, he found a, a body in a buffalo robe and uh, he reburied it and uh, worked around it. And his daughter's in her 70s. I'm friends with her uh, up in South Dakota, and she was real pleased with how I treated her dad because I said he would not have put her where this water would have deteriorated the body. He thought it was an Indian because she'd been wrapped up in a, uh, and dressed as an Indian. Uh, and Carr's report says that she was uh, buried in the best buffalo robe it found in the village and two lodge skins. So this guy dug it up right here. And so we did the all this ground penetrating radar all around. We didn't go up over here. Um, that's the one site where we need to go. This is the graduate students at DU uh, with Larry Conyers. They spent two days out there going over the ground penetrating radar. This is Doug Scott and his assistant. And we spent two or three days uh, testing what was found on the ground penetrating radar, about eight sites. And uh, Danny Walker was there also for three days uh, with me. I don't have a picture of him. And so I had to write up a report, and that's chapter 13. Well, I'll end it here. The Native Americans say a story stalks a, a writer. And if it finds you worthy, it comes to live in your heart. The writer's responsibility is to give that story a voice. Every one of those chapters can be read by themselves. Um, Spencer and I were talking since the book is uh, just being mailed to me now. I ordered 100 softcover. I've already sold about 30 of them. And I ordered 100 hardcover. I won't get those for three weeks, and I've already sold 50 of them. Uh, those people have already sent me checks. Um, but if you want to buy one, uh, you can mail me a check right there, Post Office Box 252 in Beulah, and um, hardcover, softcover, and there'll be no postage because I'll take it into the Heritage Center and you can pick it up there. If you want to mail to you, add $5. And now I'm going to exit, and um, I think that brings us back, and I can get out of that. And do you see me? And Megan, you come back, and I went about 10 minutes longer than I wanted to. Um, are people there? Yeah. Hi, Jeff. Come back Hi. Back. Um, we do have questions for you. I don't know if you can read them. Yeah, I got time. All I right, I'll let you do it. So. All right. All right. Does anybody want to ask any questions? I didn't. I don't see any questions written. I don't see Spencer in here. Um, but I think you have to um, type questions to me. I'd be happy to answer. There's Spencer. Uh, did you get? Were any questions sent in during my my quick talk? Oh, you got sound, Spencer? Um, I and presume you all there. Yeah, there we go. Okay, sorry about that. I'm glad you said something. <laughs> yeah. um, so, so I see one question. A couple of people commented. It's very interesting. Thank you for this offering. Some people are happy with it. Uh, the one question I see is... Um, uh, where did the suggestion of a ceremony performed over the deceased come from? Was that the ledger art? I mean, assuming. on the Kidder Massacre? Yeah, at that site that you'd found. Friends. Yeah. Um, there are accounts that go in the 1800s that were written. Um, when um, it, it wasn't, it, if you look at it, it was brutal, okay? Uh, it was absolutely brutal. They mutilated these guys. Um, I read an account that when they would torture them, um, the first thing they would do is uh, they would tie them down and then they'd cut out their, their tongue. That way they can't scream. The next thing they do is they pull out their eyeballs. Um, and then they would um, uh, put gunpowder in the eye sockets and set it on fire. I think this is what Lieutenant Jackson said. Uh, some of the accounts, uh, uh, the first-hand accounts of the bodies uh, 
would would speak in the old English, uh, you know, uh, mutilations too uh, horrible to describe. They generally castrated them too and, and stuck their, I hope there's no children watching, and stuck their penis in their mouth. That's how they were found. And many, many accounts in that uh, depredation claims that I found of, uh, of that. of that. But from the Indian side, okay, we see it as terrible, horrible, barbaric. But for them, this is an enemy. And this is an enemy in the afterlife that will want to get them. So if they cut their eyes out, they can't see. If they cut their fingers off, they can't hold a weapon to get back at you. And of course, you you humiliate them with the uh, castration at the end. And there's power in conquering your enemy. Um, they would cut the sinew out of the legs and use that sinew to make arrowheads. Um, instead of the buffalo sinew, uh, that was special medicine. Um, any uh, victim that they killed and captured, their uh, legs were sliced open um, for the sinew, um, for, that, for that very reason. But for them, it was almost a ceremonial thing. That um, uh, finger necklace that I showed you was taken at the dull knife fight, and that medicine man survived it. And I got it in the Bureau of Ethnology, an 1880s book. They're very rare. Um, I've only had that book for about six months. Uh, I mean, it's taken me 25 years of research to find one. <laughs> um, I got three of them now, different ones. Um, and and uh, uh, there's a, a, a several pages that describe about these. They got two finger necklaces. With the finger necklaces were two medicine bags made out of human scrota. And uh, uh, the finger necklace I showed you doesn't show the scrota. The one in the in the book does. They laid it down in the middle. Um, that's in my book. Um, <clears throat> and uh, in addition, there was a medicine bag that had several uh, Shoshone baby hands. It was all the right hand that were cut off. And it was the Shoshone scouts that led the military to the dull knife fight in 1877. Uh, not far from Buffalo, New York. I've been there a couple of times. And, and uh, in, in this report that they're writing, the medicine man is demanding the, those things back. They're his. You can't keep them. They went to the Smithsonian. Um, and I'm sure the Smithsonian doesn't have them anymore. Those things were given back after that 1973 Reparation Act uh, to the Indians. Uh, there was a finger necklace at the Cody Museum. Uh, that was that they got back in the 20s or something that had 16 uh, index fingers of white men that were alleged to have come from the Custer fight. And when I got my Garlow grant there, I, I, I asked them about that. And they said, yes, we have it. It's in our vault. Um, no, you cannot see it. No, you cannot take a picture of it. But they said uh, the Indians get to uh, have a private ceremony inside the vault with the finger necklace once a year. Nobody goes in there but the Indians. Um, so that's how finger necklaces are treated today. You just don't find them. Um, and uh, that that one, that's hand-painted in that uh, Bureau of Ethnology that I found in that book. Um, but it was ceremonial to them. Now, this medicine. This was their, this was their spiritual power. Um, you got to understand that. Um, you, you know, it's... It's a clash of cultures. Uh, in, in my new book, I uh, the, the preface is several pages given the Cheyenne history and what brought them, what, all the causes of the war. That's complex. There's a lot of things. But it's basically the intrusions of the white taking away their natural resources. And uh, um, But I, I have it all laid out. Um, and that was a good question, Spencer. Did I answer it right? Jeff, I'm going to save Spencer from going back on. But we... Um, we've got a couple more questions for you. Okay. Um, do you want me to read them to you? Or you... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I don't see them. Yeah. So um, the next reading. one is, why do you think other historians don't go to the Library of Congress or go to the sites? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, 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 okay. You want to read my chapter seven in, in the book. Uh, I said that British publication. Um, uh because I, I explain things in there. Uh, to be polite, they're lazy. Um, I spent 60 days probably, I, you know, I didn't save calendars and write them out and do this. I didn't, I, I deducted um, 
from my taxes. Uh, but I always, you know, went too much deductions where I couldn't take that much. It didn't matter to me. Um, I over 10 years, I probably spent 60 days there. One, one time I made the mistake of going for three days and uh, you, you should not go for less than a week. Uh, and it costs. Um, I remember my hotel, the first time I stayed, the closest hotel was a Holiday Inn from the National Archives on Pennsylvania. And uh, I had to walk a mile to get there. And it was $1,200 for 10 days. Um, uh, that was just my hotel. Those uh, copying at the National Archives, and now you can, with, you can do it with photography and stuff. Uh, that they'll let you uh, with the phones. So uh, that's even better than putting original documents in the Xerox machine and, and, and then having the big bright light go over it and stuff. So they prefer you coming in with cameras now. But back when I was doing it 20 years ago and 10 years ago, I, last time I went there was probably um, 2010. Um, it was 25 cents a page and I got 11 feet of documents uh, of which maybe I, I, I know I got five feet, just six feet, of just Indian depredation claims. And so I measured them out one time and it was uh, uh, $40 for an inch. And so take 40 uh, times 12 times 11. And that's what I spent just to copy stuff. I, it, historians won't go there unless they get grants, unless it's paid for. That's why I ended up with that quote. If a, a story uh, dwells in your heart, if it finds you worthy, uh, you know, the writer's responsibility is to give that story a voice. Um, I'm not into this to uh, make money. I'm not into this to uh, make a reputation. I'm into this to preserve history. Um, and I think that why they don't go there, um, they're lazy. I, I, I named some historians in chapter seven, so I won't do it here. Uh, yet by my book, but, uh, there's some contemporary historians that have done some bad, bad research. It's called historiography. My degrees are in philosophy and philosophy of history, the early, the great historians from William Henry Jackson, um, and Carl Becker, uh, Merrill Mattis, these were people that studied philosophy as much as they studied history. Merrill was a good friend of mine. Um, and he, he uh, um, they, they, these people uh, don't understand historiography. So they think I get everything they want online, you know, and, and some historians think that uh, the stuff that I do is a waste of time because it's all been recorded before. So what are you doing? Repeating stories. I'm correcting misinformations. I'm getting accurate stories. Um, so that was a good question. What's the next one? All right. So the next right. question is, um, looking forward to reading this book, what projects do you have planned next? Oh, very good. <laughs> Thank you for that question because, um, uh, well, look, I got sitting here. Can you see this? This is a box 41, okay? Uh, I have 70 of those boxes, and they're full of documents, okay? Um, so some years ago, some years ago, I, when I put them in those boxes and ordered them, every one of them has a legal f file. And so I, I made things, you know, newspapers, 1870, big, thick thing, you know, uh, captivity accounts, me. And, and so I, I made a thing, and that was, uh, uh, what was that? That was about 48 pages. I've been, for the last two months, I've, and I'm two-thirds done with them, I'm going through every single one. See, I'm on box 41 now. And and I, I'm, I'm pulling out every file. This is my new one to work on. And I'm looking at every story, and I'm giving a summary in that document because I can now do a word search on names, events, and all that. I've already gone through my stuff on Beecher Island, and I was just blown away with how much stuff I have on that. So my next book is going to be Beecher Island because my next project was going to be to do one of those roundups again or something like that that I can do longer than what they allow. They have word limits for Western Historical Quarterly and Montana and the West Magazine and Pacific Historical Quarterly and stuff like that. You, you won't publish this stuff in the Colorado history stuff, but Nebraska history will, and Kansas history journals will, but but they, they have word limits. And I write about three times the length of that. They make chapters and books. And um, so the raids, by the way, that led to um, 
Black Kettle's death at the Battle of the Washita by Custer on November 27, 1868, started in August raids of August 10th through 14th along the Saline River in Lincoln County and the Solomon River in, in Mitchell County. And they came back two months later and went on the Solomon River in Ottawa County, in Cloud County, and killed a lot of people and took captives and stuff. And, and the historians don't get any of that stuff accurate. And I've got these depredation claims have these firsthand accounts. So I had this big uh, file for newspapers on, um, uh, I think it was called Indian Raid newspaper articles. So they cover everything. So I mean, I spent uh, a week just going through those newspaper articles so I could cite who and what and all that. And the stuff that I've got with the uh, come later and, and accounts and all that on those raids. And then it just sort of like hit me about um, a month ago that there's not been a good book on Beecher Island. Um, there, the best book uh, was by Orville Crickey called 50 Fearless Men. And it's just a little bit on Beecher Island and a lot on each scout. Um, uh, <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> I'm gonna call it, I think, Solomon Adventures in Beecher Island because that, they were avenging, the, they were, those scouts, were, they were called Solomon Avengers. And so that's gonna be the, the next book. Um, which, by the way, if you've ever been to Beecher Island, they're doing their ceremony September 20th. Um, I'm going to be there. I've spoke there before. I got a good friend speaking there this time. Um, the, the the real battle site is almost five miles um, uh, west following the Rickery. They got it wrong. I got all the evidence for it, too. <laughs> so uh, we'll correct that. <laughs> so, yeah, that was a good question. That's my next project. I got everything here. You should see my library. Um, I've got about 4,000 books, you know, all of first edition stuff. Um, and, and just to show you, just hang tight. Um, <clears throat> see, here's, here's a nice old book, right? <laughs> I just got this a few weeks ago. This is a history of, a biographical history of Cloud County, Kansas. Well, that's where they have these Indian captivities. This is 1903. It, it's in bad shape. I, it'd be re, I need to get it rebound and all that. But this is a $400 book on, on the used book market. You're lucky if you can find one for $300. I found that for $40. I've been looking for it for 10, 15 years. I had copied the relevant pages. I have it in one of these file boxes. And uh, so, yeah, I, you should see the stuff I have. Uh, the annual reports to the Commissioner of Indian Affairs going back to 1854. Uh, through it. I got a lot of them. <clears throat> That was a good question. That's my next one. I, I don't have to leave my house. I can write it all here. Okay, Jeff, we have time for one more question. Um, Carl okay. writes, um, I've heard that perhaps some of those seeking uh, depredation funding exaggerated or lied in order to get money from the government. Do you have any thoughts you can share? Yeah. Um, see, I have some far left uh, uh liberal historians who attack the depredation claims. I have friends that share me the emails. on. They've not published that, by the way. Uh, they're doing like interviews for Wild West and that sort of thing. Of course, there's some exaggerations, but you know, um, the thing about that, um, I've been studying the Indian depredation claims now for uh, almost 20 years. Um, the guy that wrote the book on it, I would recommend you get Indian depredation claims. That's what it's called by Larry Scogan. Uh, he's a friend of mine uh, that I've met through all this. Um, he's getting one of the books. Um, he just retired as the president of uh, Bismarck State College. Um, his doctoral dissertation got published by Oklahoma under Indian depredation claims, uh, uh, 1790, 1920. And I've worked with him on that. I, I, I chat with him on the phone an hour at a time when we talk about things and stuff. And we've raised this very issue out. You have to take those affidavits. And, and this is that historiography. This is that chapter seven. This question is also answered in chapter seven. When you get a document, you've got to compare it alongside the other documents. And, and where they're contrary, you've got to use your critical thinking skills to figure out how, who might be telling the truth. Now, now in, in response to that, I, there's, you know, we all know the golden rule. There was an uh, an intellectual golden rule that uh, my mentor that I did my dissertation on him, uh, a, a British philosopher, I knew him too, real good guy, he's dead now. He, uh, he talked about in one of his books, the intellectual golden rule. And that is if you have an opponent and they make an argument, 
you have to, your, your duties is to interpret that argument in its strongest sense and then attack it, not its weakest sense. Um, you commit fallacies when you do that. Well, there's a historical documentary golden rule too. When you have contrary documents, can we come up with an interpretation that will allow them both to be true? And um, so, so you work with these and yeah, they may have exaggerated much like uh, uh, insurance claims. You know, when they had that fire in Colorado Springs that, that devastated so many homes um, and, uh, you know, the insurance claims made on all of them. What, I'm sure they overvalued many times what something was worth. And um, and and you see them overvaluing it. They, in the depredation claim, they say, uh, well, this cost uh, $125 in Kansas City, but to get it out here, it costs $150. And, and besides, uh, the government sent in field agents that spent weeks going and interviewing people to make sure that these people making these testimonies are... are honest people. Uh, and they, they weeded out some fraud that way. And, and, and then they, uh, they devalued the value anyway, by his, uh, by one third. Uh, there's one guy, um, Thomas Meisel, uh, his little eight year old boy was uh, killed in the Indian raid when they came back in the Solomon Valley in, in October of 1868, he was running with his two older brothers who escaped to a neighbor but he was a littler one and, and Indian shot him in the back and killed him. Um, you know, I went to Glasgow where that town that was built was which where he was killed, went into a coin store. I carry in my wallet in 1868, three cent piece just for him. Thomas Meisel was living in a dugout. His wife had died in 1863 when he was serving in the Civil War. And so he did a, I got his pension file. He did another, um, he re-enlisted and found out his wife had died a month after he re-enlisted. And his colonel told him to go home. So when he filed for his pension claim, he got it denied because he was a deserter. Well, he had to find that colonel and get it all fixed out. He did. But, um, you know, you, you, they tell his stories in there. And he's not lying. He's living in a dugout. And he valued his everything in his dugout was destroyed. All of his camp stuff and his furniture. And you know what his losses? We valued him at $52. And when they came in and did the investigation on it, they said, well, these were handmade things. You know, he overvalued, they uh, deducted it by a third, <laughs> $52. He handmade his furniture, so it's not worth what he said it was. But you know what? His boy died. And he didn't even say it in the because he didn't get a compensation for death or injury. But the other witnesses to it that were saying when the boys came to the other house, his uh, little boy uh, didn't make it. The Indians killed him. Even his dad, Thomas Meisel, didn't say, I just found his grave uh, in Concordium. I'm going out to Kansas next time I mean, on this book tour in October. I'm going to go up there because he's got a, a headstone there for little Benjamin Meisel. Said he died in 1868. Um, you know that, uh, yeah, he was killed by the Indians. Um, so we're going to throw that out because they overvalued uh, something. These are sworn statements. Uh, that under oath, look up affidavit in the Oxford Universal Dictionary. That's a, a testimony in a court of law. It's accepted unless you can prove it to be a lie. And they sent agents into the field to verify these people are telling the truth. So, yeah, they they overvalued things. You don't get rid of those depredation claims because they overvalued. It. That's like throwing out insurance claims. Oh, it didn't burn down. They overvalued it. <laughs> well, they weren't attacked by Indians. I deal with that in chapter seven. You'll like that. I'm, I'm very critical on those people. You, if you heard that about depredation claims, I know who you heard it from and that, that person's named. Um, so anyway, that's fun. You get me going. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> you know, uh, attack the documents, okay? Attack my uh, research. It's thorough. It's complete. And these people can't do it. Um, so, uh, but I, I, I got them in chapter seven. Um, so uh, I'll have fun with that. <clears throat> anyway, I've enjoyed it. Um, I, I really, uh, I think this is going to be a good book. Oh, let me end it with one other thing. Um, you, you get a, you get a copy, uh, and you can get it from Caxton right now. You can get it on Amazon. You don't need to get it from me, but, um, you can read it in any order. So if you say, you know, I want to read chapter 12 first, go ahead and read that. 
it, because there's an introduction to each chapter. They're all done by themselves as separate stories, but they're chronologically set. That's what sold Caxton on, on uh, doing the book, by the way. Uh, it, when you get on their uh, website and you see the description of the book, that's what they said. So uh, I've, uh, Caxton's a good publisher. I'm really pleased with him. Um, so anyway, thank you. Jeff, thank you so much for your presentation tonight. And now we now have to go read your book. And welcome <laughs> back. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Bye, bye, bye everybody. Thank you, Megan. Okay.